welcome to the Soap Bible Study video series from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. We're in our second week of uh, 1 Corinthians, right? second of, I think, five weeks we're going to spend in 1 Corinthians. And uh, we're doing right about a chapter a day for the, for the most part, yeah. I think, in this reading. We're moving, so, through, moving through pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. So last week we started and, and we learned that Paul actually established the church in Corinth. And then Paul moves on and, and he's over in Ephesus. And I don't really know if Ephesus is over here or not, but, you know, it's over here. If you're looking at the map. <laughs> If they're looking at the map, yeah, then I got it for him, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking either way I can I can justify this. <laughs> uh, but Paul's now in Ephesus, and some people from the church in Corinth came from Chloe's household and said, we got problems. And that's quite a trip. Actually, right, to, they're actually doing that. Yeah. They didn't send a letter. They sent people. And 1 Corinthians is Paul's response for coming in there. So last week, we really learned about three things, three big things that happened in the church. Um, and the first one was Paul was criticizing them because they were divided over teachers. Mm -hmm. Some were saying, oh, I'm with Paul, uh, I'm with Apollos, I'm with Jesus, I'm with, you know, Joe. And and Paul says, guys, stop it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you don't want to, you want to do this. Is, is, is Christ divided? Does it really matter? We're just the messengers. Right. It's the message that's important. Yeah. Uh, and then the second point kind of goes into the first point where Paul said, look, when you were, when I was there with you, I had to feed you spiritual milk because you weren't ready yeah. and you're still, you're still not, not ready. ready. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Here? And that one, you know, you, you kind of make fun of the church, but we need to think about it from our standpoint too, <laughs> as individual Christians, how long have we been in church? Where's our maturity level? And, yeah. and are we not that week after week, we would get more mature, but are we seeing a steady line where there is maturity right. and there is growth? Yeah. Um, yeah. Some kind of yeah. Some milestones, kind of forward some moving, time, right? Yeah. Something that's at least yeah. measurable, hopefully. Yeah. 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 And then the third point, Paul ends with, uh, he calls it a father's warning. Um, I call it, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And, <laughs> um, and I think when the, when the Corinthians read this, I think they were stung a little bit by it. Paul has some has some kind of harsh words, but he's trying to light a fire under anything, yeah. uh, is what it looks like. So now we get into that's chapters of, of one through four. Yeah. So now we get into chapters five or chapter five, and he starts out with church discipline. Yeah, we've got a series in chapters five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It was just issue after issue after issue. <laughs> These yeah. are specific things that either he knew about or they asked about. Five and yeah. six are things that he was told about. And so he's going to address. Starting with chapter seven, there are questions that they had. And so now yeah, he's, he's going to respond. To, yeah. And so this week, uh, you, you'll actually hear um, a kind of a tone difference. In chapters five and six, it's sort of like, yeah. well, okay, this is... I don't know what's wrong with you people, but here's what, you know, here's what needs to happen. Yeah. Starting in chapter seven, it's like, okay, let's, let's uh, sit here and answer your questions. Yeah. Question and, and the tone changes drastically. Yeah. Well, but here's the deal in chapter five, right? There was a, there was a Christian who was having um, relationships with uh, his father's wife is, yeah. is the way it's put there. Yeah. So, so the assumption is, is that the son is sleeping with, with a stepmother. Yeah. Uh, we don't know if the father died or if there was a divorce. Um, so that's the first problem. And then the second problem is the church approved. So, Not just approved. Yeah, it was, well, yeah, they approved. <laughs> <laughs> they so, were proud of it. Yeah, I mean, they right. were, they were like, they were like, see how culturally relevant we are at First Corinthian Church. Yeah, I would think we would call that woke today, right? <laughs> In today's yeah. terminology. Yeah. Well, um, Paul Paul went so far as to say that the type of sexual immorality that is going on, even the pagans wouldn't do that. You have you have not just gone back to you know where you came from. You have blown past so far past that line that they wouldn't even come with you, right? Right. So, so Paul and continuing in that same tone, uh, Paul says, hand, hand them over to Satan. Yeah. And we need to be a little careful here because Paul does say 
so the spirit may be saved. So he does recognize that this person is a Christian, that this is not a salvation thing, uh, but he does need to be removed from removed from the church. Yeah, there needs to be some kind of Christian discipline. The person is not repentant, obviously. Right. The congregation thinks it's fine, or at least the majority of the leaders think it's fine. And so Paul has to step in remotely and say, if you're not going to do what's right, I'm going to tell you what to do, and you need to follow my instructions, right. which we find out in 2 Corinthians they did. Right. So they excommunicate him, and Paul's thing is, again, even the, even the pagan surroundings wouldn't put up with this. Right. So by kicking him out of the church, not only do you no longer have the fellowship of believers, but you're going to be shunned by everybody in the area. Once, once people find out what you're doing or yeah. what you've done, you're going to have nowhere to turn. Yeah, and Paul equates that to food again <laughs> uh, from the standpoint of yeast and bread. Yeah. So so the, the thought process is a little bit of yeast significantly changes the bread. Uh, a little bit of sin in the church can blow up the church yeah. and, and really and really do it in. Yeah. So, you know, nip it in the bud. Uh, we need you need to make a decisive, decisive yeah. effort here. Yeah. So and so, it's not just for the sexual immorality too. No, he has he has no, a he whole list of whole items. Thing. Yeah. 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 So, so so the concept here is, um, it's better for a believer to basically be to die physically, and uh, rather than continue what they're doing and let their spiritual maturity, their spiritual life degrade. Right. It's not a salvation thing, but it's, I mean, he's like, kick, kick him, him out. out. Let, let, let yeah. Satan bring him to well, ruin. In fact, don't even whatever. associate with him. Don't even eat with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No so, fellowship with him at so all. So that brings up the question of grace. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and in first Corinthians, it, the, it ends there. Yeah. It's done. Uh, right. It, it's done. Uh, second Corinthians, interestingly enough, the same story picks up. Yeah. Right. It seems that this person did repent. Yep. And the church wasn't letting them back in. And Paul's like, well, guys, well, hold on a grace, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what we're all about. Well, and he repented. The... You know, if you honestly believe he did, welcome him back. And that's the whole purpose of Christian discipline is, is for repentance and restoration. Right. Yeah. It's not just about, okay, we're done with you. Kick them out. It's we're going to break ties with you. We're going to kick you out of this so that you'll see how big of a deal it was, so right. that you'll really repent, so that you can be restored, and our, our our bond is going to be stronger when you come back. Right. Which is exactly what happened. It's a perfect example of what's supposed to happen when it, yeah. in Christian discipline. Yeah, but we don't get it just from reading First Corinthians. No. So, so we need to yeah, make well, sure. And, and That's part the of, kind of things we should be bringing up. Yeah, and part of that is because Paul was just telling them to do it. Here, we don't know whether they did. We don't know. No, yeah, we, exactly. We don't know. Well, the it was a letter, right? There's a yeah. time. There's a time. Limit. Yeah. So Second Corinthians two, if you want to read about it, uh, is is sort of like the backside of the story where where he says, "Let him back in." It's it's been long enough. <laughs> yeah. So you said uh, chapters five and six were issues that Chloe's household brought it's up. Apparently, yeah. So in chapter six, it's about lawsuits. Yeah. It seems that the church was having a number of lawsuits. I don't know if it's church against people or people against people within the church, Christians against Christians. That's what it seems to And be they right. were going um, outside the church. So they were going to a, a Gentile court. Yeah. And Paul's like, why would you do that? Yeah. Um, and a couple places, uh, he did not consider these um, huge issues, you know, these trivial issues, these small, ordinary issues. So right. we're not talking about you know, some obscure thing that maybe right. does need to go before a magistrate or, or somebody different, yeah. something that should be able to be resolved within the church. So today we might say, um, uh, let, let's let say, you know, small claims court or something, yeah. just something, you know. Right, you know, owes me, owes me some money. Yeah, you know, $600 or less right. or whatever the thing yeah. is, right? You <laughs> right. know, small claims court, it's like, you guys really can't handle this on your own. You really don't have enough spiritual people. You don't have elders. You don't have anybody there in the church. Right. It just shows the level of division that you were already talking about yeah, in division. chapter and maturity. one. And maturity. Of, yep. the, of the people. Yeah. So so kind of interesting in there. Um, the next section is fleeing sexual immorality. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he starts out with, you know, all things are lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that kind of play with, um, you know, because we are a Christian, because we are doing things... Um, 
we don't have the set of laws like we did under under the um, you know Jewish Jewish laws. So more things are available to us, but doesn't mean they're beneficial. Right. Right. And so there's a bunch of choices that, that we that we need to make. Well, and the follow up is really interesting too. all things are lawful, but I will not be controlled by anything. I'm not going to get into anything where now I don't have the freedom to leave. I don't have, you know, so there's addiction, there's other stuff there, you know, uh, right. Blackmail, extortion. Right. You know? Well, and prostitution was, it was, it seems to be a huge problem in, in Corinth, in Corinth yeah. uh, as a whole. We talked that it was a port city. There was a lot of foreigners there yep. and there was also a lot of, uh, worshiping of, um, you know, gods that had a lot of uh, fertility. <laughs> yeah, fertility. Yeah, well, and that was especially, he was writing from Ephesus, which is where the Temple of Diana was. And so that's fresh in his mind right. as he's looking out over the plaza or something yeah. there. But he, he doesn't start with, uh, with prostitution or sexual morality. He starts with food again, right? It's like food yeah. is for the stomach, not the other way around. Real similar to what Jesus said. Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. It's not, people are not designed to serve the system, right? Yeah. Or people are not designed to put it in today's terms. People are not designed to serve the earth. Yeah. Sorry, the I was earth. reading ahead on yeah, that no, because uh, <laughs> it was, uh, uh, we would kind of end on food to idols too. Yeah. And I was like, boy, yeah, is, that, is that now? Yeah. 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 So yeah, the earth was designed to serve us. Right. Right. Uh, Sabbath was made to, you know, give people rest. Food is to, you know, keep us right. from being hungry. Not the other way around. And I think that's part of his, I'm not going to be controlled by your laws, by your systems, by any addictions, by anything that right. is going to take a hold of me. Right. And it seemed like it was pre prevalent in the church. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then, then we get into chapter seven. Uh, interesting chapter from the standpoint of a big chapter on marriage. Right. Yeah. Right. And celibacy. And uh, I think it's important to note at this time, Paul, Paul was actively practicing celibacy, too. So he was, a, he was, of course, advocating for it. And what we need to be a little bit care, uh, careful of, not too careful, all we have to do is read it, because Paul pretty much clearly states, this is, this is my thoughts or my wants. This is not me. This is God saying here. So yep. he kind of he has two camps that he, he goes back and forth with. Yeah. And, and even maybe one further, because there are there are things that he considers, well, what we would say is biblical. Of course, he wasn't saying it biblical yeah. necessarily. There are two two sides that he was saying are like from God, and once and one that was just his opinion. The first one he says, "The Lord says this, not me." So yeah. Jesus has already spoken to the to to one issue. The second time he says, "I say this, not the Lord." That doesn't mean it's just his opinion. It just means that Jesus had never spoken on it. This is an, this is an issue that has not yet been put into Scripture. But he, as an apostle, is writing this down, and he does believe it's biblical. It's 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 inspired. Right. But then there's a third section where he says, "Listen, this is my opinion. If I were you, this is what I would do." But hey, you've got to make a decision for your own self in your own life at this stage. And I think yeah. we, uh, it's important, like you said, we need to make sure we understand each of those sections. Yeah, so there's a number of conditions there, too. I don't know that we want to get into each each one of those. Um, you wrote a book on it yeah. <laughs> uh, so they can get in. But it, it is couples that are couples that are married, you know, should can they get divorced? Should they not get divorced if one is a believer and not a believer? So there's a, there's a number of different things going on here. And one of the advocations from Paul is, hey, if you're single, I suggest you stay that way yeah. because of things that are coming up. Yeah. So what was he looking forward to? What, what's coming up? So within, in, in less than 10 years from the time he wrote 1 Corinthians, Nero was going to start his persecution against uh, uh, Christians specifically, Jews and Christians. But Claudius had already started his persecution against Jews in the Roman Empire. And so Paul, I think, foresaw this coming That's against Christians. Worse. He didn't know when or exactly how it was going to happen. But his thing is, is given the, the political climate <laughs> that yeah. we have, given the, the situation that we're in, we really need people who are dedicated to ministry right now. And, and I think this is a really important point that, that doesn't get stressed often enough is he says, if you are married, no, for, let's, for, he says, if you're not married, 
you have time, you have money, you have resources that you can spend into ministry. If you are married, you cannot do that because you have priorities at home. Yeah, interesting point. And and that's very important because if you're married, you have priorities at home. You don't get to spend all your time and money doing ministry and neglect your home. And Paul knew that. And so his thing was like, my opinion, let's all just do ministry. But not everybody can do that. So if you're going to get married, get your priorities straight. Yeah, interesting. Um, the one, the other point I want to talk about is if if a Christian is married to a non-Christian, uh, the Christian shouldn't divorce the non-Christian because there's a chance that the Christian's life will bring the um, spouse to salvation. Yeah. And they use something about Paul says the unbelieving spouse is sanctified. Yeah. So what, what, what does he mean by that? So the word sanctified just means set apart, you know, sort of consecrated or sanctified. Uh, set apart. Um, it doesn't mean safe. Some people look at this and right, say, right. You know, if, if I'm a Christian and, and my, and my partner saved, isn't, right. yeah, because I'm a Christian, it doesn't, my Christianity doesn't uh, envelop my family. Yeah, right? Right. Everybody has an individual choice. But your faith does bring something to the home that there wouldn't be if you were not a believer. So there is something, there is, there is a, a kind of set apartness that your home has if even one person is a believer or one spouse is a believer. Um, right. And then you can work on, you know, the, the children are going to have a different nurture and, uh, you know, environment than if you, there were no, if neither parent were saved. If neither spouse was saved, there's going to be a different, different thing. Right. Now, it's possible, and here's the thing. It's possible that the unbelieving spouse says, man, this is, you are not the person I married. I do not want to do this anymore. Right. And they take off. And Paul says, you're, that, you're clear. You're in the clear. You didn't do it. You did, it's not that you were running them off. It's not like you became this nag or this you know, horrible right. person. You're trying to live their faith and they want nothing to do with this. You're in the clear. So from a divorce standpoint, yeah, absolutely. Right? If they if they right. if they divorce the believing spouse, then um, yeah, that is That's not held against that is not held that. against the believer. That is legitimate. And if they go on and and uh, and remarry, it's um, not considered adultery, you know? right, right? Right. His his only thing is that uh, <laughs> if if somebody is going to remarry, they need to remarry uh, in the Lord. He says, right. you know, find a godly person. Right. Yeah. Uh, so then we go into the the next part. It's still in cha- uh, the same chapter. Uh, we're in chapter seven here. Uh, it talks about the circumstances of your calling, mm-hmm. and Paul goes to kind of great lengths. If this happens to you, you need to do this. You need to do this. But what, what's this whole section about? Well, uh, part of it is is specifically has to do with marriage, because there were some people so I, who were like, okay, well. I wasn't a believer when, when uh, we weren't believers when we got married, but now I'm a Christian and I shouldn't be married to this person. So now I've got to leave. He says, no, no. Yeah. When you were saved, whatever situation you were in when you were saved, just becoming a believer does not automatically give you the right to change up everything. Right. Okay. There's people, there's circumstances. So it'd be like, um, you know, uh, I can't, I'm, I'm in a job, you know, I have a particular job um, that, you know, you may or may not like that job, you may or may not like, you know, whatever, and you become a believer, that's not the excuse for quitting your job. Now, there may be a reason to quit your job. Um, now that you're a believer, there may be some moral issues, there may be some mm-hmm. things in your maturity that you didn't know about, but just because, hey, I'm a Christian now, doesn't mean you get to just change up everything in your life. Right. You've still got life. You've still got people. You've still got responsibilities. You've still got all of these other things. So I think he uses uh, he uses uh, circumcision as an example in yep. here, um, there, and a number number of other examples. Yeah, you're, you know, a, a Jew doesn't stop being a Jew because they're a Christian. A, a Gentile doesn't stop being a Gentile because they're a Christian. You don't need to be circumcised or not be circumcised. If you're a slave in in that culture, if you were a slave when you were saved, that doesn't mean that you automatically get to come go back to your master and say i'm a christian you've got to free me that's not the way it works yeah (laughs) right so um 
Now, if if a if a master becomes saved and wants to free slaves and wants, that's on them. Right. But it, his his point is, you know, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you get to upset the apple cart all the way across the board. Right. Right. Especially in a secular world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So then we end, we end in chapter eight. Uh, do we do, I think we do all of chapter eight, right? Or Yeah. Okay. Uh, a big part of it is food sacrifice to idols. Yeah. And this is where I thought we, thought we were going er, earlier. Uh, but the idea is if, if everything is, is acceptable to me and, you know, I can do it, that means I could, I could, can legitimately eat food that is sacrificed to idols. Absolutely. And, and Paul, Paul is right there, but there's a but yeah. in there. Right. And, and the but is that we shouldn't eat that food if the people you were with are immature Christians and they have a problem with it. Yeah. Um, because uh, as the more mature person, you should take the high road and not to introduce any questions into, into somebody with a with a more immature faith. Yeah. So what's really interesting about this is that this concept has been abused by people right. to say, well, I just don't like it, therefore you shouldn't do it if I'm around. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about someone who is genuinely like... Right. If, Trying to be a Christian, maybe new to the faith. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let's say you're the you're the mature Christian and I'm the immature Christian, right? Right. And you're like, this is going to be a great steak. This, you know, whatever. And somehow I find out, uh, you know, I'm I'm coming over to your house and we're grilling or whatever. And somehow just around the conversation, it's like, yeah, I was at the market and, you know, I got this stuff and whatever. I'm like, which what which <laughs> which stall which stall did you which market did you right. get this from? Oh, I was over at I'm like. That, did you know that was sacrificed to this God over here, this idol? You're like, yeah, sure, no problem. I'm like, but right. you know, three weeks ago when I ate this meal, because I've only been saved for three weeks, I was actually worshiping this God. Now you're saying it's no problem. That is a conscience right. issue for me now. Right. And so your responsibility is to help me not sin against my conscience, which for you right. means, you know what, that's that's true. This is going to be a problem for you. Yeah, I'll, I, I need to do something different. We'll do something different. Now, tomorrow night you're going to eat it. Yeah. I'm not at your house. It doesn't matter because it's right. not sin. Right, right. But but the sin is me putting a roadblock in your, in your path. Right. So now I'm sitting here at your barbecue all night long with this weighing on my conscience, this guilt. If I were to actually right. eat it, if I were to actually even have it, I'd be I'd, I'd be going home like I just cr committed this huge sin against yeah. God, and right. that's what you don't want to do. Yeah, it's not because I said, "Well, I'm offended that you would eat that." Like, that's really not my concern, yeah. you know. Yeah, and it's and I've heard, uh, yeah, it's just, and I've heard a lot of people who should be mature Christians using it that way. Like, you're really going to take the position of an immature believer. <laughs> Just because you don't want me to do something, right? Okay, that's immature, but <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. The, so the key, by sorry, the, the key, no. is, the key in verse one is is love builds up. The, 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 what it really comes down to is how are we building each other up? Not yeah, versus not, putting roadblocks and, yeah. and stumbling blocks yeah. out in the way. Right. Yeah. Good. Good. So that's that's the end, man. That was a quick quick kind of synopsis. I'm sure it didn't seem quick, but there's four chapters there. Yeah, yeah. We blew there's through a lot of material. stuff. We skipped over a lot of stuff yeah. too, and as we always do. So if there's something we skipped over, and you're and you are saying, I wish they would have spoken to that, you know, pop it in the comment here. Send us a message. We'd love to um, to respond to that. Uh, we like hearing from you. Um, uh, we, we get responses every once in a while and somebody says, would you, or, you know, I really like this part or would you speak to this? That's great. We'd, we'd love to answer that for you. So if there's something that we missed, um, also yeah. if there's something that pops out to you throughout the course of the reading, you're like, oh wow, I've never seen this before. This is so great. We'd like to hear that too. With the, not just yeah. questions, but uh, we'd love to hear that too. What you're learning. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So next time we will continue uh, into chapter 9 and beyond. Until then, I uh, hope you have a great week. Bye.